welcome to part three of our salmon tour here at Donkey Creek. We are offering you the last couple stops of our very popular live walking salmon tour, um, which we're unable to do this year, so we thought we'd bring them to you digitally. Um, before we begin, I want to acknowledge that we are on the um, land of the Spoyalapak people, better known as the Puyallup tribe of Indians, and we recognize them as the original stewards of this place. Now, today's tour is going to be talking about a variety of things. We're going to review the salmon life cycle, and maybe do a little body movement, um, which you're more than welcome to participate alongside of us. We're going to be reviewing um, what in the heck those big barrels are over there. We're going to also talk about the riparian zone and the plants that inhabit either side of the stream. And we'll also spend a little time talking about the predators that are in this area as well. As always, we welcome you to post into the comments where you're watching from because that's information that's really kind of useful and fun for us to know. It's great for us to know how far our message goes. And if you know of anyone else who would like to see this video, please do share it. That really helps uh, our message of stewardship go out. So let's start with our salmon life cycle. We are talking about chum salmon today, but this general life cycle that we're, we're gonna go over applies to almost all of the salmonid species that we have here in the Pacific Northwest. So luckily for us, the wonderfully talented Stina Torres has created some fantastic artwork here. She's uh, a little modest, Thanks, but, <laughs> but it really is wonderful. And um, this is a great way for us to kind of visualize the salmon's life cycle. So I'll go through it quickly and then we'll get our bodies moving and act out our salmon life cycle. So uh, life begins in the fresh water, in the, um, in the creeks of the Pacific Northwest. So we have uh, female and male spawning salmon that come up and they will select a site that has a really good gravel that's got the right flow in clean, clear streams. The female will dig a, a nest. The eggs will be laid and fertilized into that little depression in the gravel. And then they'll hatch a couple of months later to be these adorable little alvins. These alvins have a yolk sac that's attached. That's gonna be their source of fuel for the first part of their life. Then when that is absorbed and they begin feeding into the creek, we call them fry. Once they transition to the salt water in the estuary, they undergo smoltification and we call them smolts or fingerlings. They're about the size of your finger at this stage. Then they're gonna be in the salt water for three to five years where they mature. We just call them adult salmon. This is what you'd likely see on your dinner table. Um, and then three to five years later, they kind of get this timing right and they'll head back from the Pacific Ocean all the way to the stream of their hatching. So we have this really kind of great cycle here. Um, so I, what I'm gonna do is we're gonna use Stina and I'll walk you through what we do with our school field trips. So we're really sad we were unable to do any field trips today and Stina and I were talking, we're like, no, let's just do it. Let's just do it for the live video. All right, so Stina, I need you to be an egg. Beautiful. Now you're going to hatch from your egg right around New Year's Eve. And you've got that big belly. That's your yolk sac. You're in your Alvin stage. All right, now that's gonna shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink. And now you are a hungry little fry and I need you to find some bugs and eat those bugs. Beautiful. Now it's time to go to the salt water, but first you have to undergo smoltification. Yes, very good. Transformation. Now you're saltwater fish. You're swimming in the ocean. You're eating krill, getting fat and happy. Now it's time to come back, Sina. So now you gotta swim. You gotta. Map. Oh yeah, pull out your map. Your GPS. <laughs> Type in your address. How do I do it, Rachel? How do I get that? <laughs> you're gonna want to use your nose, Sina. Use your nose. Use your nose. Use the magnetic field of the earth. Beautiful. Use the stars. Use the stars. Yeah. Use. Oh yeah. All the things. All right. Now you've made it back to your home stream. I need you to do the salmon spawning shimmy. There it is. Um, now you're dead. Your dead salmon face. No, it's pretty good. The eyes. The eyes have it. Now dead salmon. 
Oh, dead salmon. But that's okay because from our dead salmon, we're gonna have um, some transfer of nutrients. Would you turn into a tree, please? Ta-da, beautiful tree. Lovely. And I'm gonna shade that tree and keep it nice and clean. For the, and then we would do it again. And Eggs and Alvin and Smolten. <laughs> We really miss field trips. It's it's such a shame that we don't get to be out here with kids <laughs> in there. But um, but we do get to be here with you. So thank you for tuning in with us. Um, let's talk a little bit about how humans have taken that life cycle that we just talked about and sort of hacked it a little bit to increase the productivity of our salmon. So if we look across the creek here, we have what are these kind of weird barrels. These are called remote site incubators. And what they do is they kind of protect the salmon in their most vulnerable stage. So our chum salmon lay about 3000 eggs on average, but only about 10% of those will hatch to become a fry. The rest will be washed downstream or consumed by predators, which I'm actually surprised we don't see too many predators in the creek right now. Normally there are uh, a number of ducks that are hanging out here. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, other predators that might be lurking in the forest nearby. But so the losses can be really uh, terrible for salmon in that first early stage. Now this remote site incubator takes water from the creek um, and diverts it into a settling pond so any sediments can be washed out. Sediments can be incredibly detrimental to salmon eggs. They kind of smother them and cut off the flow of oxygen and fresh water. Um, so sediments can be deadly. We never want to see erosion near a salmon stream. And then that clean, clear water is going to flow into each one of the barrels. And they flow from the bottom to the top so that our salmon, when they first hatch out of their eggs, are in a series of trays in these barrels and they go kind of head down into those trays. So they're not going to be washing out until their yolk sac is absorbed. Let me come back to our life cycle. So eggs, eggs in go the trays. into the trays, Alvin hatch in the trays and we head down to the bottom of the barrels. Once their yolk sac is absorbed, they're going to go on a little bit of a slip and slide ride as they head to the top of the barrels looking for food and looking for the surface where they can fill their, their swim bladder, um, their kind of gas bladder inside. So they go to the top and once they do that, they overflow out and go whoosh, whoosh down those pipes and out into the stream. Once they're in the stream, their lives are identical to their wild counterparts. So they imprint on this place. They have the kind of the memory of the smell of the water here and they kind of imprint on this location geographically and then they're going to make their way out. Now this is a very short um, run. In fact, the salt water does infiltrate all the way up here on a very high tide. So our little fish don't have very long to head out. And this happens around kind of late March, early April, depending on the temperature and how fast that they grew. And chum salmon head out to the salt water um, after only a couple of weeks in the freshwater. And then from then on, they are saltwater fish. Three to five years from uh, the the year that they hatch, they'll return back to this creek. So this RSI is not flowing right now. It is shut down. They get their eggs from the Minter Creek Hatchery, which had a, a bit of a problem with a disease outbreak a number of years ago. And so they didn't have any excess eggs to uh, donate to this project. And so for three years, this has been empty. Um, I'm not sure whether they will get uh, eggs again this year. We'll have to find out. My guess is though with uh, COVID and the hatcheries being kind of short staffed and not operating at their full capacity that they will still pause on, on eggs from here. Yeah, and I want to just mention for the chum, their life cycle is three to five years. So we kind of see, might see, start seeing those impacts. So the fact that three years ago there wasn't an RSI and we're starting to see all these lovely There's salmon carcasses. Out here. There's still fish coming back, but again, that could be fish kind of from that. There's there's some wiggle room in that three to five years. So they could be 
the five year fish from from five yeah, years a number ago. of years ago. So um, uh, we'll know in if we if we still don't. I would imagine that we might see a decline in the number of fish in the next two or three years um, if the remote site incubator is not running. So this um, they get about a million eggs. Um, and about 900,000 of those eggs are gonna make it. So that really does bolster the number of fish that are kind of produced in this stream. This is a very short stream and there is no way for 900,000 eggs to survive. Um, if you think about how many fish it would take to accumulate that, there's just not enough territory within the stream for that many pairs of salmon to produce reds and then have that type of success. So this is one way that humans can kind of intervene in the salmon life cycle uh, to bolster those numbers. Yeah, and I also want to mention, I think, uh, like thinking about hatcheries, a lot of times, I mean, there is some interesting projects they're doing to make sure like the genetic diversity of salmon is, is kept, is kept yeah. <laughs> happening. So um, I think that's an interesting topic with uh, maybe not, not enough time for us to totally dive in today, but um, we encourage, check it out. Do yeah. some, do some research on your Do local hatcheries. right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we mentioned in last week's salmon tour that this whole area has undergone a bit of a restoration and that is also going to start to help our salmon be able to make it back to this creek. There are wild spawning fish that go up past the hatchery um, and that we do see babies that are kind of upstream from here in the, each spring. So we know that some of those fish are making it to viable habitat beyond the stream. So we do see some, some wild fish uh, hatching and returning here. So that's a bit about our life cycle of salmon and our remote site incubators. Let's take a moment and talk about um, those dead fish down there. Yeah. We get also quick shout out, Mary. <laughs> Thanks oh, for your donated. donation. Thanks, Mary. And also for those of you tuning in, if you could let us know in the comments where you're watching from, um, we'd love to know that. So pop, pop that in. Ready, go. Dead salmon. All right, dead salmon. So we're looking at salmon that are in their final stage of life. So they have, they have spawned. Um, they have kind of died. There is one live salmon. Can you see that? Yeah, there's one live. It looks like a female maybe. It looks like a stick, actually. It looks like a log. <laughs> you have to trust it that that's a live fish, I promise. We saw her swimming earlier. <laughs> um, but most of the fish that we're seeing, and I see about 20 carcasses here, which a lot of people, I think, get concerned about, right? If you see a bunch of dead animals, they're really stinky. You're lucky those of you at home don't have smell of vision here today. Um, they're stinky, they're kind of gross, and they rot, and normally this would kind of be a bad thing, right? If you saw 20 birds just dead on the lawn, you're going to want to call somebody about that. Um, but salmon, this is normal and natural for them. And this is actually really important for the riparian zone. So that word riparian means the area adjacent to the stream on either side. And really we're talking about all of the trees and the understory um, plants that are growing stream side. And the riparian zone truly benefits from these salmon carcasses. Some of them will get washed back out into the salt water um, and can enrich that area, but many of them are gonna be consumed and eaten by predators that are hanging out right here uh, in, the, in the stream. Even for an urban stream like this, we still see evidence that there are some predators. Now, let's turn and talk a little bit about some of those predators. Probably the most that we would see. I really wish I had a real live river otter and raccoon to show you, but <laughs> all I have is skulls, so you'll have to settle for that. Um, the river otters and raccoons are these small predatory mammals that come down to the side of the stream, and they will eat both live salmon and spawned out carcasses. And if we look at their teeth, we can see they're pretty well adapted to that. So river otters are foraging both in the creeks in the salt water. We often see uh, river otters hanging out in the Salish Sea, in the Puget Sound, because it's such a really productive environment. There's lots of fish out there, not just salmon for them to eat. And they have these great canine teeth that can be used for holding on to a really slippery fish, right? They are also good for defense of their territory and kicking out other otters who don't belong in their space. But then they have very pointy 
um, the kind of first set of molars, carnassial almost. Um, they're definitely carnivores. And then these back teeth are very, very sharp and pointy. So that, that really is conducive to eating slippery and hard to catch foods. Um, they have decent sized eyes, um, but they're not quite nocturnal. So we would expect to see river otters active um, throughout the daytime hours. In fact, if you spend much time hanging out at a creek, you'll probably see one. They're, they're pretty common around here. They have a large brain case, so they're pretty smart little creatures. And then if we look at our raccoon, raccoons are a little bit more, um, they kind of eat a little bit of everything. So yes, they do have those big canine teeth. Would you say trash panda? I would say they are great <laughs> trash pandas. Um, but if you look and compare their molars in the back, they're more smooth and ground down because they do eat uh, a variety of foods, not always just straight meat, um, that sort of thing. Um, but again, really nice big brain case. They're smart little trash pandas, which is why their interactions with humans can be uh, a little challenging at times. And notice the size of the eye socket here. It's much larger than in our otter. This is a nocturnal animal or occasionally crepuscular. And I say that because I freaking love that word. Crepuscular means active at dawn and at dusk. So much larger eyes on an almost um, similarly sized animal. So both of these are really common predators that we would see taking advantage of the salmon and the rich source of protein that they bring up into the stream environment. These two critters usually don't just camp out at streamside and eat their meal, they're gonna pull them away. And if you watch them, they have these kind of great little paws, both of them do, um, and they're able to grab a hold of salmon. I've even seen uh, raccoons like carrying one <laughs> and walking on two it's legs. It's a full, full <laughs> effect here. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> um, and they'll pull those away from streams and go maybe closer to their home territory and what they're effectively doing is moving those nutrients from the immediate area of the creek out throughout the riparian zone yeah and that transfer of nutrients is really what benefits these plants you can see even the tide you can yeah. see that carcass in the grass so bring it on up predators <laughs> And then let's talk about um, one of the largest predators that we see around salmon stream. Not necessarily near an urban stream like this one, but this is the black bear. Uh, and this is a real black bear skull that was donated to us um, from somebody who said, you can have it if you can tell me what it is. So we figured it out, it's a black bear. But here we go, we're looking at another diurnal animal. So one that's active during the day, very small eyes. So they're um, utilizing daylight hours really nice big teeth um, and they are kind of a jack of all trades when it comes to food. They will eat salmon if it's there so during the fall um, kind of heading into winter this is pretty critical for them to be able to take in all those calories and accumulate the fats that the salmon bring and of course bears aren't going to wait for them to spawn and <laughs> that sort of thing. <laughs> Omnivores! Omnivores for the win. Uh, decent sized brain again with these mammals so they're smart they can figure out that humans are a source of food um, and that causes problems from, for them generally. They have some other cool adaptations, um, including a kind of a large jawbone where this muscle is gonna attach up to the crest and occipital ridge at the back. Um, this is all gonna be filled with muscle. And if you've ever looked at a bear and watched them chewing, you can see those muscles kind of flexing on the top of their head. Really cool predator um, and they, carry quite a bit of those nutrients away, not only in the actual carcasses that they eat, but also in their waste as well. They pass through um, the undigested remains are going to be nutrients that these plants and trees can utilize. So let's talk about the trees a little bit. Yeah. I Could you, should... A quick question yeah. on, do we see river otters in the harbor often? And what is the best, where is the best place to view them? So I see river otters all the time in the harbor. Um, if you stand still long enough, you will see a river otter. Um, they're quite prolific all up and down the entire shoreline. Anywhere where you have um, kind of a natural bank, they prefer that. So if there's growth of plants right all the way up to the shore, if you hang out there, you're probably going to see a river otter. Um, a lot of boaters really dislike these little, little weasels because they will um, utilize people's boats um, to eat their food and to defecate in. And it's quite stinky if you ever have 
um, an otter and they tend to be to travel in family groups and so where you see one you will see many um, the most successful place i've probably observed the most otters down at uh, narrows county park or the narrows bridge park right there that's owned by uh, pen met properties um, if you just sit down there there's like a family that lives right in the woods there and so you'll see five or six otters just whoop, whoop, hopping down um, going out into the bay to feed to catch food um, sometimes they park the little young ones on the beach and say like, sit tight, I gotta go get dinner. And then they go out and grab food and then they all kind of scamper back up the beach. Um, so yeah, great questions. I love seeing these guys, they're so cute. Um, we don't have, I'll mention, we don't have sea otters here in this part of Puget Sound. Um, we're a little too far inland for that. They really like incredibly wave swept areas and big kelp forests, which we are, um, we only have a few of those around here in the sound. So if you want to see sea otters, you got to go, I think Desolation Sound, Desolation Island is the only place to see them uh, here in Washington. You're more likely to see those guys if you head over to the Oregon or California coast. Um, okay. Or Alaska. Or Alaska, yeah, there's everywhere. <laughs> All right, so I think we should talk about trees a little bit. I'm going to bring my skulls because that would be a weird thing if you're just a public person walking by and you're like, oh. Um, but let's head this way um, in Donkey Creek Park and we can talk a little bit about kind of the plants that are found here. I'm gonna, I think our mask wearing makes sound a little difficult, so try and keep to this close to you. There we go. All right, so we're walking by um, kind of, this is a really important species. This is our state flower here in the Pacific Northwest. This is the rhododendron. And we passed one a second ago that was blooming. Don't you know? It's almost December. Oh, no, come on. Um, some roadies do bloom <laughs> twice a year. Um, oh, and there goes a bee. So this is an important source of kind of last minute pollen and nectar for our pollinators. Uh, but really cool to see rhododendron um, means red tree. Um, and that's a reference to their kind of blossoms because they naturally are kind of reddish. Also, pinkish. just going to notice... Yeah. Himalayan blackberry creeping <laughs> through creeper. <laughs> so, right. some invasive species. We can peek a little closer at our creep some. Perfect. Um, so, when we're talking about the riparian zone, the areas adjacent to the creeks. Um, we can see a couple of things uh, that are contributors to the success of the salmon. And probably the number one way to help salmon is to make sure that the riparian zone is really robust with a high diversity of species. Oh yes, so the, um, the downy woodpecker, that's a really good comment uh, here from Kara. She's saying that the downy woodpecker is dependent on the riparian zone. And there are many species that that's true for. We have a variety of different um, kind of trees and forest and kind of habitats within the Pacific Northwest, but riparian zones adjacent to wetlands or adjacent to streams and lakes are some of the most important and some of the most um, biodiverse, I would say. So we're looking at a couple of conifer species. Um, this one I love to point out because it's Big. I can't even get a third of the way around this <laughs> How many people do you think it would take to give that Douglas for a hug? Well, this, is like a <laughs> um, this is a really, really huge and um, big, stately, important tree that we have here in the Pacific Northwest. Take North a West. tour up to the top. This is uh, the Douglas fir, um, whose scientific name is Pseudosugo menziesii, um, which is kind of a mouthful. But uh, this Douglas fir is not a true fir. Uh, true firs have branches with the pine cones on top of the branches. And this one has cones that hang from underneath the branches, which let's see if we can find a cone. Here we go. They're usually pretty easy to spot. Anytime you're near a mature one of these, they'll have these cones. Um, and I can always recognize a fir cone because they're fairly soft, squishy throughout. If you've ever felt a true pine cone, they're very hard, sometimes have little barbs and hooks on them, um, and they change shape depending on how desiccated or how dried out they are. 
Um, what I love about the Doug fur cones is the legend that little tiny mice in a forest fire sheltered in the cones of the Douglas fir. And you can see their tail and hind legs poking out. Yeah, can you get the contrast of your nail or something? So there's that little mouse, little mouse butt hanging out. It's so cute. It's so cute. In reality, that is the seed. So if I pull it on that, I can maybe get, nope, oh, just broke it. Um, it's a tiny, tiny seed, right? Um, so there are multiple seeds within a cone and it only takes one of them surviving, germinating, to turn into a mammoth tree like this. Yeah, I'm also noticing uh, this little remnants of that English ivy, which is another invasive species we see a lot of here. Um, oh yeah, ivy really, really good anchor <laughs> into that tree bark. And then of course, when it gets windy, they can act kind of like a sail which is not good for a big tall tree that might fall over. So uh, if you can remove English ivy from <laughs> trees, that's a good move. What English ivy kind of looks like. And it's an introduced oh. species. Um, it's not native to here. And while it is pretty, it's not great because the plants here did not evolve alongside it. So they don't really have a good defense against it. And like Tina said, it can cause uh, their demise ultimately. So, this being a really disturbed and um, kind of, we've meddled here for a long time here at Donkey Creek. So there is English ivy and other um, invasive plants here all over. Um, but back to our big gigantic Douglas fir. This is a very important species for shading the creeks. Um, you can't really tell on this big mature specimen because the canopy where all the branches are is so high up. But when they are juveniles, they are really good at growing up through the understudy and providing shade throughout. Uh, so this is a good important species that we see. Another one that's really great is this one right here. This is Western Red Cedar. You can see how it gets that kind of red name both by the color of the bark as well as the color of the wood. And Western Red Cedar is one of the most important species uh, especially for the original people that were here. So uh, Coast Salish tribes all up and down the Pacific Northwest relied on this species above all others. It has the most uses, everything from medicine to clothing to diaper material uh, to houses, canoes, cooking utensils. Uh, this is definitely like the most important species. And you can always tell a big leaf or a western red cedar by the swooping branches. So they always kind of swoop down. Look, even on this juvenile, um, this is a little tree. Just barely <laughs> the branches already begin that swoop. And the branches come all the way to the ground. So our Douglas fir, the first branch is pretty high up there. But the western red cedar has branches all the way at the bottom. This provides a lot and shade is critical to salmon streams. We don't want them getting too hot in the summer. Um, we don't want too much runoff and rain that falls on this tree is going to gently fall um, and kind of help prevent erosion somewhat. They're also really good at being wet in their roots. So anytime you have a riparian zone, there's opportunities for flooding, places where you have kind of salt water influx, that sort of thing. And this is one tree species that can survive that and actually thrives in this kind of wet environment. And the other one that really does well here in the riparian zone is this tree right here. Still got a couple of little leaves on it. This is red alder. Um, and red alder uh, kind of has a bad rap for being kind of a weed tree because it loves disturbed areas. So any place that's been logged or developed um, alders really thrive there and what alders can do is they can take nitrogen from the air and put it and deposit it into the ground and make that bioavailable for many other plants. So though alders themselves aren't necessarily prized for their wood or much else, they are important for preserving the kind of um, productivity 
of the ground, which is really pretty great. Um, and that's another thing that salmon do. So if you have a stream that doesn't have salmon but does have alders, you will see continued growth. But if you've got a stream that has salmon and alders, you're really in a good spot for um, having really kind of fertile ground. The double whammy. I'm just going to take a look at the trunk. Oh yeah, pretty smooth. Um, often has lichen that grows on it. Um, if you compare this to that bark of the Douglas fir, you can see it's a kind of a much different style of tree. This one's much yeah. smoother. And then Here's... you've got this rotten species. I'm going to pull it off because it's a bad guy. But take a look at the adaptations that this has to hooking on into the bark. It gets nourished from the ground. It gets all of its water from the ground and it can grow up this entire 60 foot tree. Um, but we don't like it, so. <laughs> they come off easy when they're young. When this uh, kind of stem gets about an inch, it's almost impossible to, to remove them. Um, and here's another Do you have to worry about this? pieces of this regrowing. Yes, it is um, really good at surviving here in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> Chunks of it will just root uh, right where they are. So uh. Here's a dug fir that's growing up uh, through the understory in the shaded areas. It's got really kind of nice, very aromatic needles. Um, always good to see those little guys kind of coming up. Um, what else did I want to talk about? Oh, let's talk about some of these understory plants, not the ivy, but the other things that you can <laughs> see down here. Um, we are kind of well known here in the Pacific Northwest for having lots of mosses, lots of ferns, things that thrive in the moist areas um, also do benefit to having the stream and having this kind of riparian area accessible. You can see across the way, uh, all those green trunks over there are big leaf maples. And they've lost their leaves, but they are everywhere. And this is a, a species that really thrives in western Washington. It's not really found um, east of the, the mountains. And they are, their leaves can be about a foot across. Uh, yeah, here's a bigger one. Uh, nice big sized leaves. They're almost kind of fuzzy. If you are a car owner here in Washington, you probably hate these guys come March when they start dumping pollen all over your vehicle. <laughs> and it usually happens. Uh, March is pretty wet, rainy season. And so you'll just get like yellow paste everywhere all over your car. I drive a black car, it drives me crazy. Um, but I'm glad for the pollinators that can feed on that kind of one of the first flowers that comes out in the spring. So they're not all bad. So all of these kind of species combined help to create really viable habitat for salmon. This is all providing shade and erosion control for our streams, making sure they're clean and clear so that when our salmon come up, they don't have to worry about sediment in the water. They're not worried about cooking because uh, the water temperatures are too high. Also so, being able to breathe in cool yes, water. Yes. Warm, Warm water, water doesn't hold oxygen yeah, if you've as well. Had soda and you left it out on the counter it goes flat very quickly it's because as it warmed up to room temperature it lost the ability to hold gases um, and oxygen being the main one that our salmon are going to need they need cold clear streams because they have plenty of oxygen in them. so the trees benefit from the source of nutrients that the salmon bring up and then deposit in the form of their carcasses and the predators that take them away from those places but the salmon could not survive without the trees either. So the two of them really work nicely together and we have this almost partnership between the trees, the other predators that call the forest home and the salmon all together, um, kind of creating this really rich biodiversity that we have here. So we would recommend if you, um, if you care about salmon, you really want to take steps to make sure that their water is clean and clear. Um, so that means leaving the riparian zone untouched replanting when you can when the area has been disturbed so <laughs> this is uh, a fresh little sapling that has been transplanted here how often do you get to pet the top of a tree that's going to be so 
so yeah when we see these young trees kind of the next generation coming in that's always a good sign it means um, that this area is still in that renewal process trying to get it back to a more wild state where we have really mature trees of all um, all different species biodiversity is key to a healthy ecosystem so we always want to see that so we encourage you come out to the creek side make notes take a little journal with you do a photo tour um, trying to see how many species you can find and then you know what's your favorite we'd love to see those comments in the in the comment or your observations in the comments you can also email us if you capture something really cool send us a photo maybe we'll throw it up on our instagram to share or feature it in our wild side weekly newsletter awesome. we're always looking for fun cool wildlife interactions and wildlife doesn't necessarily have to be big fuzzy cute mammals right we don't only care about the otters and the raccoons and the bears we care about trees and mosses and ferns too so uh, we love to see any and all um, photographs that you take or accounts that you you notice maybe you're a nature journaler and you want to come creek side and do some observations um, all we ask is that you're respectful of the environment that you're not going to be you know breaking things and taking things um, home with you um, unless it's ivy you can take as much of that home with you as you want because <laughs> it's everywhere here we don't really like that stuff there um, and then if you're observing salmon in the creek stay back don't you don't want to go totally creek side um, you want to wear muted colors not bright blue um, try to blend in with the trees uh, so that you're not frightening them and making them spend extra energy our salmon runs are kind of wrapping up for the year um, usually by the first week in December so you might want to come out and get your kind of last view of a few live fish while you can until they're back next year. Sina, anything you want to add? Um, I guess if you do want to take the ivy home, be prepared to plant something in its place. Because uh, again, <laughs> erosion's bad. So we try to, you can, yeah, rip it off the trees, but don't actually take it all off of the ground because yeah. then we have bare soil, which isn't <laughs> great. Um, so um, we see something cool. Oh. This is a tiny baby Douglas fir, and this is so small, I'm guessing it's not uh, been planted here. I'm guessing this is an original recruit from one of the really big trees in our area, it. one of those colons probably. Just kind of look at how, how <laughs> from, from this little tiny <laughs> to that. <laughs> yeah, they can reach over 300 feet tall, which is just amazing to me. Ooh, got a little predator yeah. coming down for a snack. So we got a glaucus wing gull, it looks like. Nice. Hard to tell, it's a juvenile. <laughs> so yeah, come see some salmon. And of course, if you like eating salmon, make sure you're eating wild caught salmon that's sustainably harvested. That's another really important thing you can do for, <laughs> for, for protecting salmon and that conservation. Um, what is the new pipe thing installed around the corner toward the schoolhouse? Uh, the new pipe thing is so oh! It's part of a drainage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is to prevent erosion from the storm drain as it entered out into the creek. Uh, the original storm drain got a little bit too much volume and was kind of blasting the, the sediment away from that area. So they put in this kind of weird looking T-shaped um, drainage end to try to slow that water down a little bit. Awesome. And then we have Howard. Did you hug a tree? Rachel hugged definitely a hugged a tree. We kind of need, we need a team to give a full yeah. <laughs> Douglas fir embrace. <laughs> There you go. And also, hi mom from Montana. Glad we could bring you to the creek here, here in Washington. I love it. <laughs> okay, with that, we are so appreciative of all of you. If you feel like you'd like to catch up on part one and two, we have those posted on YouTube as well as videos in our Facebook feed. So feel free to check those out. Like, subscribe, follow, all those good things. Uh, Mary, again, appreciate your donation. You can make that through this app as well as on our website and we'll have giving tuesday harbor wild watch will be part of that on december 1st so yeah we'll be doing more fun live videos for you all um probably always <laughs> this is our this is our new thing um in december you can look forward to some really late night videos out on the beach while we uh virtually bring you to some beach monitoring events so thank you all so much for coming and learning about salmon we appreciate you and as always Learn, Learn how fun!